Well, good morning. For those of you that are watching, do not adjust your screens. Pastor Jeff did not gain about 200 pounds and about a foot in height. <laughs> I have some of that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm just a servant. Um, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a pastor. Uh, I'm just a humble servant. And when I was asked to do this, at first I said no. But then I remembered I'm just a servant. I haven't done this for about 10 years. Um, I'm used to having a pulpit. I don't know how you do this without a pulpit. Nothing to hide behind. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So if you see my legs shaking, it's not me uh, doing a nervous uh, or a uh, Elvis impersonation. It's just nervous energy. So today, Palm Sunday, like what we've been talking about already this morning, we're going to talk about the week. What went wrong? Or did it? Did it go wrong? We're going to start in Matthew chapter 21, and we'll read verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king come to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes to the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So I can only imagine, first off, when he says, go find me this donkey, and it's, it's the coal and the fowl were full. I can only imagine the disciples were like, what? Why? You're the king of kings. Why are, we, why are you going to ride in on something like this? If nothing else, we should carry you so that people can praise you and worship you and see you for the king that you are. But our Jesus, once again, he says, no, because that's not what he was. So he comes in, he comes into the temple, and the crowds are going crazy. And just like she spoke about this morning, I can only imagine the tears and the joy and the hollering that was going on. I watch videos of uh, different concerts, and I noticed like the Taylor Swift concert that's going on right now. As soon as she walks on stage, People just start bawling, just start crying. And I'm like, why? <laughs> exactly. But then I, then I think, I bet that's what was going on in that day. When Jesus rode in, can you imagine how many people were screaming and yelling? They were thankful. They wanted to praise him because finally the king of kings had come. So these people were praising him and worshiping him. And did he sit there and gloat and take it all in? No. He was still just that servant, still just that person, humble, humble as he was. And he walked, as he got off the, the donkey and he walked through the city, he wasn't there to start trouble. He wasn't there looking for trouble. He knew it was going to come, but he wasn't looking for it. He's basically walking around the city, surveying, seeing what's going on, seeing if the stories that he heard were really true, and they were that day, he had the look of a king. As he rode in, he did. He had the look of a king. And at that time, that's when, can you imagine the rage and the jealousy that started to build within the chief priests and the teachers? Because none of them got the same treatment. So can you only imagine the rage, the jealousy that started? It's day one. After he'd done that, 
he goes to Bethany. Him and his disciples go to Bethany and they stay with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now keep in mind, Bethany, two miles away at least, and they're walking. So not only have they walked all day long to get to the temple or to get to the city, now they walk another two miles to go to Bethany. There they rest and now they're hanging out with Mary, Martha, and like I said, Lazarus, the same person that he raised from the dead. Don't tell me that wasn't a party. That was people getting together that loved him, appreciated him, and knew what he was of or what he was capable of. But yet, he still, he didn't, he wasn't proudful. He didn't gloat. He didn't take advantage of it. He was still a servant, but yet treated as a king. So day two comes along. So day two comes, and they decided he's going, we're going back to Jerusalem. Again, two miles. So he walks another two miles to Jerusalem, walks in, and now he remembers everything that he had seen the day before. And now it's time to take action. Now it's time when he goes through and he walks around, and people are still, oh, he's back, he's back, yay. And they're singing his praises, and they're shouting Hosanna. But Jesus has got business to take care of. So he goes into the temple, and he sees things going on. Now it says, you know, money changing and business and things like that, which I take it to another level. There was corrupt business dealings going on. There was corrupt money exchanging hands. It's one thing as you're selling your goods and services or whatever, but then there's another thing when there's corruption behind it. And that's what was going on. Jesus, as perfect as he is, as perfect as he was that day, still felt, he felt that anger inside because they were disrespecting the temple. What do you do? Everybody knows the story. Started flipping tables over, calling people out on their actions. Now, if you're a business owner, and you're already doing corrupt things, and now this man comes in and destroys your table, your business that you're trying to get money for corruptly, now, now you're ticked. Because now he's ruining your livelihood, but for good reason. So the rage begins in these people. <clears throat> so now you've got the chief priest, the teachers, and now these business owners or these business doers, they're filled with the rage and the jealousy. Now he's caused this big stir and all this is going on, but yet he stops and he takes the time to sit with the poor, with the smelly, with the lepers or whoever, with the sick, with these people that nobody wanted to do, have any dealings with. So all this is going on over here. He stirred the hornet's nest. That's on them. But he took the time out to sit with those that nobody else wants to. And again, like I said, ones that are homeless, the, the smelly ones, the ones that nobody even could stand to be around, the sick, the poor. These are the ones that the chief priests and the teachers and everybody else would have nothing to do with. They were cast aside. But now, whoa, but now, I just about ripped my ear off. But now, here he is sitting down with them, and he's getting praise. And the chief priests and the leaders see this, and now again the rage builds. And now it adds. They were already ticked off before, but now the rage continues to build, and jealousy builds. <clears throat> at that time while he's sitting there worshiping and, and preaching to and teaching and just listening and that was the big thing that I kept reading over and over again was he was just listening he was listening to those that are hurting I don't know about some of you but for me as a man I try to fix things my wife will come to me with a problem, and i got to hurry up and find a solution for it. When all she wants is just someone just to listen to her. Just listen to what I have to say. 
And that's what Jesus was doing. He just sat and listened. He listened to their hurt. He listened to their joy. He listened to them as they told him the story of their lives and where they'd been and where they're at now. He just listened. So as a sidebar, I just say, sometimes we just need to shut up and listen. Just listen. So again, the rage build, the jealousy build. And at this time, you know, he looked, remember the day before, he looked as a king. But today, day two, he looked as a priest. He looked as a teacher. The rage built. The jealousy built. Can you see where we're going here? This is only Tuesday, day two. So after he done with all that, what did he do? Traveled back to Bethany. Another two miles. I have trouble walking from here to my car without running out of breath. I can't imagine he walked four miles, two miles there, two miles back, plus all around the city. <laughs> it just, again, it blows my mind. But day three comes. Now, this is a good one. Day three, what's he do? They all wake up, they have breakfast, whatever, and they start back to Jerusalem. This is where we come upon the parable of the fig tree. So, as they're walking along, Jesus sees a fig tree. It's a beautiful tree. It's all filled with leaves and branches and everything, but no fruit. So, what does Jesus do? Curses the tree. The tree begins to wither. Why? Because the tree didn't, the tree didn't bear any fruit. And that's where the parable comes in about you may be this big, strong Christian or whatever you think you are. I'm paraphrasing here. But if you don't bear the fruit, if you don't bear the fruit, you're nothing. You're nothing. So that's where that parable comes in. I encourage you to read that one. It's a really good one. So day three comes along, as I said. He does the fig tree as an example of faith. He enters the temple and he starts teaching once again. But now his authority is being questioned. Because now the chief priests, the elders, the teachers, and so on and so forth are saying, okay, enough is enough. Who are you? Who are you to come and do all this and say all this and get these people worked up and things like that? So his, question, his authority, if you want to call it that, begins to fall under question. So Jesus, being the wise man that he is, was, is, instead of just calling them out, he starts telling stories, parables, and he's sneaky about it. So he tells the parables. He tells, tells the one about the two sons. He tells the parable of the two tenants. Pretty soon, I can imagine, as these guys were standing around listening to him, and they've got their arms crossed, and they're all scowled down looking and listening, and he's telling these stories, little light bulbs start going on. And they're like, wait a tick. He's talking about us. Can you, he's talking about, no, he's not talking about me. Yes, he's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about all of us. Don't think that once those light bulbs started going off, that uh, rage and jealousy started coming even harder because now they were humiliated. Now in front of all these people who they were supposed to be the leaders of, now they're humiliated. Even though Jesus didn't come right out and, and call them on it, it wasn't as in, isn't the way it worked. But yet, they were humiliated. And the rage and the jealousy started again, or started to build even more and more. Hmm. So, as he leaves there, they're done for the day. They go, they stop at Mount Olive, um, Mount Olive and they give what's called, the, I've never heard of this before, called this the Olivet Discourses. Never heard of that before. But basically, he was telling parables to the disciples. And as he's going through and he's talking to the disciples and he's saying all this stuff to them, that's going on here. Meanwhile, back at the temple, it starts. Now it's really going on. 
But as the disciples are learning and they're t- listening to him, some of them, some of them are listening, some of them are worried because they see what's going on. They don't know what's going to happen. They're listening to what he's saying and the things, the words that he's giving them, they're worried because they know something big is about to happen. They go back, they make the, they're finished there, they go back to Bethany again after walking all this time. It's when Mary, as they're in Bethany, Mary sits down, washes his feet. Wow. First off, I don't know if anybody here has ever been to a foot washing ceremony before. Okay? Um, I have, um, but we kind of Western civilized it a little bit and just did hands because feet would just be too nasty. We can't wash the feet. We just wash your hands. It'll be a symbol and blah, 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 blah. So, first off, so now Mary decides to wash, wash Jesus' feet. The man who had just finished walking about eight, ten miles that day in the sand and the dirt and ech, sandals. sandals. So a man, and, and they didn't have pedicures, no mani pedis. So just imagine what it was like. But Mary humbles herself and washes his feet. But not only did she humble herself, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. When you do something like that, it's a twofold. It's a twofold. I'm not advocating that we do that anytime soon, but it sure would be an act of humility. Especially when you have to do it to somebody that you don't really care for. Hmm. That was day three. Day four, Matthew 26, 14 through 16, this is where not a lot, not a lot really happened as far as Jesus going to the temple because he didn't. But that's when the plot again was going on, the scheming began. The chief priests and the teachers are worried about a revolt. If this Jesus guy comes in and is doing all this, these people are going to revolt on us. And then what's going to happen? Then we're not going to be at this plateau anymore. We're not going to receive the money or the gifts and things like that that we normally did. So their whole livelihood is now being threatened. So again, jealousy, rage. But now scheming starts. What the heck on it? Scheming starts. What are they going to do to stop this? What can be done to stop this? Because they're also worried that if they do try to stop this, what are they going to do? What are the people going to do to them? Are they going to turn against them? Are they going to kill them? They've got to do this in a way that it looks like he had it coming. It kind of sounds like today's political world, doesn't it? Hmm. Day five comes along. Oh, by the way, day four is when Judas made the deal with the Sanhedrin. So day five comes along. This is the Last Supper. So we're all, they're all sitting around the table enjoying a meal. They're breaking bread. There's laughing going on. I'm sure there's jokes being told. Um, There's stories being told. It's just a room full of love and admiration for each other and for the mission and for the message that they were trying to put out during this week. But all that was going on, and Jesus was part of it. In the back of his mind, he knew. He knew what was getting ready to happen. And he starts talking about it. He starts starts talking about the betrayal. And the disciples are looking at each other. Oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. And as he's standing there face to face with Judas, and he calls Judas out on it, Judas says, not me. I would never do that. 
Peter decides to jump in there. Well, I know it's not me. I would never do that. You're Jesus. You're Jose. You're the Lord. Peter, you, you will deny me three times. <clears throat> how's, that, how's that reflect or relate to us during our week? Sunday we leave here and we're all on fire and we're all filled up with the Holy Spirit and we're ready to go and we're ready to conquer the world. And then one thing happens and we're on fire, we stand up for ourselves, we stand up for what's right and we proclaim Jesus' name and then another thing happens and then another thing and we start getting attacked by our boss and by our co-workers and by our husbands and by our wives and by our friends. And pretty soon that Jesus who... Just Sunday, you were standing there with your arms raised up and you're praising. You don't know him. You forget all about him. You've denied his existence. You've denied his power. You've denied his will for you. So before you sit here and you can say to yourself, I would never do that. I stand before you and say that I do it almost weekly whether I mean to do it or not. And I'm not even sitting next to him eating dinner. I just have to go by faith of what his power and ability is. Peter has seen it. We go back to washing of the feet. They break bread, they have communion. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're praying. Jesus is praying, please come and pray with me. As he's praying and praying, he knows, he knows what's getting ready to happen. And he asks his disciples, can you not just sit here and pray with me without falling asleep? And they can't. Can we even take 10 minutes out of our day every day to honestly shut everything off and just pray. No. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't because we have all these distractions, these things that hit us from left and right and we start off with good intentions. The next thing you know, we're thinking about something else and just mumbling words to God. Can we not just take the time for Him Ten minutes, 15 minutes, no distractions. Can we not find that in our day? I'm standing before you saying, I'm going to try, but I can't promise anything, but I'm going to try. But it's hard. I get it. A father, a husband, I got two little kids I got to deal with. I got a job that demands time out of me every single day when do I have the time make the time he did it for us he even called the disciples up please can you not just pray with me for a little bit had they known had they just known what was getting ready to happen as they're praying day six they're standing there they're all praying they're the gathering is around them, and here comes the Sanhedrin. Here comes the council and the kiss, the Judas kiss. Swords are drawn, ears are cut off. Jesus says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's not what I'm about. It's not what I'm about. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Whether you cut off everybody's ear or not, this is still going to happen. What's going to happen is going to happen is going to happen. And he heals that person, the ear's back on. So they take him away. But now, the council has to think of something. What are they going to do again so as not to cause this huge revolt? This huge revolt. And so the only thing they've, they've got figured out The only thing they can do is make it sound like he is a false witness or that he is blasphemous. 
So you have these people coming forward out of nowhere that I'm sure were paid to say, oh, I heard him say this. Oh, I saw him do this. He was being very blasphemous. He spoke ill against the temple, against our God. So he had just enough people to convince just enough people to say that he was wrong and he should be punished. Whereas the other ones that truly believed him and truly believed what he was here or sent to do remained quiet. The ones that had the ability to stop this or at least let their voices be heard remained quiet. If only they knew what was getting ready to happen on Friday. This is when Peter denies, does the three denials. I can only imagine, as he denied him that third time and the rooster crowed, have you ever seen somebody so scared or so shocked where it looked like the blood just went completely out of their body and they turned pale as a ghost? I can only imagine when Peter heard that. Put yourself in those shoes. So they found enough to, to, try, to bring him to trial and all this stuff and they found him guilty and when they bring him before Pilate and Pilate at first, I don't want anything to do with this. Pilate's wife comes to him and says, listen, he was in a dream of mine. You don't want anything. You don't want any part of this innocent man. Stay away. So, again, there's, there's an example in the Bible where our wives keep us in check. Thank God. So even Pilate's wife says, don't do this. And Pilate's like, listen, I don't want any part of this. I don't want any part of this. I'm going to wash my hands of this. You do with them what you want. And what do they do? They scream, crucify him. Kill him. I can only imagine the rage and the jealousy had come to this boiling point, and now vengeance was theirs, and they were going to end this whole fiasco, and life was going to go back to normal. They stripped him of his clothes. They put a crown of thorns on him, and not just gently placed it, pushed it down into his skull, into his skin, his scalp, and it's bleeding. As he's standing there naked, humiliated, they begin to beat him. Beat him. I don't know, and I hope you never have, but I don't know if you've ever seen anybody up close and personal get beat and I'm talking beat the only thing that I can relate this to and this is me becoming vulnerable to you as a 9, 10 year old little kid standing there helpless watching my mother being stripped naked and beat. Beat constantly with a belt, kicked, punched, spit on, pushed, humiliated. And I didn't do a thing because I couldn't do a thing. I had to sit there and watch it. I can only imagine this is how the disciples felt and those that loved him as they're standing there and they're watching 
and they're watching him get beat like this. And the blood is pouring from him. And they can't say anything because if they do, they know they're next. So they have to watch it, and there's not a thing they can do. Just like me as a little boy, not a thing I could do but to sit there and watch my mom bleed and watch chunks of her hair being ripped out. Not a thing I could do. But she took it because guess what she was doing? She was protecting me. Just like Jesus is protecting us then and now. He took it. And because of that, we can't take 10, 15 minutes out of our day for him, he's worth it. He did far more to deserve our, patient, our love and our time. And so, there's Friday. There's, there's good news, though. If anybody's heard this, other preachers or other pastors have said this, Sunday's coming. So we have, we have had a terrible week, but we should know and rest that Sunday's coming. We know that we're going to come back here, and we're going to get filled up, and we're going to be able to go back out again. And maybe, just maybe, this week, I'll stand up for what I believe in. Maybe, just maybe, this week, I'm going to take 15 minutes out of my day, and I'm going to get down on my knees, and I'm going to pray to him, and I'm just going to thank him. And I'm just going to say thank you. I'm not going to ask for a single thing. I'm just going to say thank you. Because you bled for me. You took a beating for me. You lost your life for me. And so I'm asking you, can you do that this week? Can you just take time out of your week to spend with him? But like I said, what went wrong or did it? It didn't. It was all on purpose. It was all for the glory. And there was a reason. Thank you. Brother, you're going to, um, you're going to stand firm this week. Because God called you not to, to go it alone. You have a wife, you have beautiful kids, and you have a, a, a pastor, a friend who loves you. And you have another friend right here, and another one right there, and two right here. Mm -hmm. And you have some over there, and you have this pastor's wife, and you have this gal back there in the back. You see her waving at us, and you have all these different ones. And guys, the thing of it is, is, and listen to me, guys, listen to me. I want you, you to just stay right there. Guys, listen to me. It's coming around again. The very things that, that he described were the exact things that happened in the Old Testament, happened in the New Testament, and they are happening right now. The disciples, you have these 12 disciples, and they're constantly bickering, and they're like, no, I want the spotlight, I want the spotlight, I want the spotlight. And guys, we have to be so careful in these days. We're not going to, to do this. Mm -hmm. we're, going to, we're going to help each other succeed. We're going to come alongside each other. We're going to pick each other up. We're going to encourage one another. This is the church today. In these last days, weeks, months, years, decades, whatever, this is the church today. We will come along one another. We will watch over our kids. Mm -hmm. We will we'll stand firm with each other. We'll speak truth to each other. We'll love one another. And when someone falls, we will reach down and we will gently That's pick right. them up and we will restore them. Mm -hmm. And we will encourage each other because there's a, a strength, a band of three is not easily broken. And I'm gonna tell you guys, these disciples, they were all about themselves. Yep. And they learned by the time that Jesus rose, well, uh, by, the, by the time Pentecost came, their eyes were truly opened. Their hearts were truly changed. 
they recognized the love that God has for them. And God wove them together. And now we're in this day again today where things are, are all about the individuals and the individual churches. I get so impatiently frustrated when I see go to this church for Easter, go to that church. It's not about the church, it's about Jesus. It's not about us being above this or us being above that or whatever else. There's only one thing. Why on earth can't we just have a sign that says go to church on Easter? Mm, amen. Why, why on earth can we not just have a sign that says go to earth, go to church on Easter? But guys, I'm, I'm telling you, they were the church people. They were the church leaders. You had that outer circle. And these were the, the religious people. This did not happen outside in the secular world. And we can sit there and we can say all we want about all of the nonsense that's going on in our world today. Well, we're crying out loud, what about all the nonsense that's just going on inside the, the religious circle? And interestingly enough, even as you drew closer and closer and closer, the one who holds firm to the end, even a Peter, a Judas, they all betrayed him. None of them stood up. That's the message. lest we fall, right? Mm -hmm. So we're here together. We keep each other accountable, right? Amen. Even when it's hard, we love each other. We speak the truth. I'm going to have you pray with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for this day, what it means, We thank you that this is recorded so that we can understand what went on that last week of your life. And God, we just, we're in awe and we're humble before you. And we know that we couldn't have done what you did. And we're thankful that you, you stood up for us. And God, I ask that you give each and every one of us that strength this week, that we stand up for you, we stand up for each other, we stand up for the church, we stand up for our pastor and his family. God, I ask for your continued anointing upon this fellowship. And I ask that your will be done in all things and that a fire will start and will continue to burn within us. And numbers don't matter. It's, it's the spirit. It's our commitment to you. And God, I ask that you just put that fire in us right now. Let us have a good week. Let us remember you. Let us remember what you did for us. And let us take the time this week just to say thank you. In your son's precious and holy name, I pray. Amen. My friends, before I let you go, um, Carl did a magnificent job today, didn't he? I mean, he did. Yeah, we, we knew that the, the, that the Lord wanted him to come and bring that message today. Uh, there was just no doubts. Guys, um, I'm just going to tell you that this is just bar none. It is just the most difficult, horrible, hard week of the year. And I would just encourage you. It is okay to have grief. It is okay to have sorrow. This is a week of, of sorrow. This is a week of grief. As we continue to, to think about these events and each day, as Carl brought back before our attention today, to relive that in our thoughts, to put ourselves there. On Good Friday, we'll have a service 
and you come and you spend as much time and we'll go through each of these days this week together and come Sunday come Sunday come Sunday we will we will we will rejoice and we will so amen God bless you may God's presence and spirit go with you may he empower you may he strengthen you all the more as you walk from this place into a world of darkness may God burn bright in you for all to see in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.